Uh, thank you, Jane, so much for, for that introduction and, and uh, the opportunity to be here. Thanks to the organizers. Uh, and, uh, and, and to all of you for, for coming to, uh, to, uh, to today's event. Uh, as, as Jing mentioned, I'm, uh, I'm a medicinal chemist. Uh, I like to think about uh, where chemicals come from and, and how they could be used to uh, cure ailments of uh, historically human disease, and we're looking more and more into uh, environmental uh, challenges that we could uh, tackle. I won't, I won't get into that today, but, uh, but actually the, the putting together the story was kind of fun for me. I went way back uh, and pulled in some things I haven't talked about in a while. Uh, because I want to want to maybe give a bit of a presage of, of what is coming from uh, from our lab, uh, but 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 broadly, you know, when we most of what we think about falls somewhere on this circle, uh, you know, that we 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 think of medicine as coming from from this, and it's my dream that somewhere there's there's a big button where you hit and it just kind of does this and the medicine pops out. Um, you know, cancer is something that we can increasingly deal with uh, in a precise way. Uh, pandemic preparedness, I think, is a very important way to think about, you know, a, 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 a new disease comes and I got to hit a button and get a drug that, that saves humanity uh, is, is what, uh, what recently uh, happened. Uh, and, and my training uh, has been in synthetic organic chemistry. I like to think about the making part of it. So I will say that this is the, the bottleneck in the optimization of medicine, that, uh, that we, only, we only design those medicines that we know we can make. And having worked, I, I spent 10 years of my career working in the pharmaceutical industry, and we would, you know, we tend to gravitate to those things that we could make by Friday, right? It's like, I, 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 I want this, the assay is going to be run on Tuesday, I got to submit my compound on Friday, so I'm, that's going to inform the decisions I make about what I design, right? Uh, and so, so we think a lot about that, and we've thought a lot about automating that, and for today I wanted to talk about automation. Uh, and I, I don't know, you know, I'm going to guess among this audience that I'm not alone in being super excited about this play. Uh, in high school, uh, my friends and I, we would all pretend that we were, you know, uh, participants in this Rossum's Universal Robots uh, play. It's a Czech play from, I think, the 30s uh, that is, you know, the, the genesis of the word robot. Uh, and so, so in high school, me and my friends had all kinds of awesome, th this is not us, awesome, uh, this, is, this is from a reproduction of the, of the, uh, the Czech play. But, uh, but so the, the word robot, yeah, 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 right, right, right. Um, I w yeah, so there's, there's Marius and Radius, and I can't remember the names of all these other robots. But, you know, the idea, if you, you can watch this play, there's the, it's, you can find it on YouTube. Uh, the, they were, they were kind of humans, but automatons, and, but, you know, they, 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 they received uh, instructions, and then they would go and, and do that. And so, but, you know, if they, where, where does this word robot come from? Uh, and so then, you know, in, in the field of, uh, of chemistry, uh, there's, there's been a rich history of the use of, of robotics. Uh, I, I, was, I was rather shocked to find uh, this, this work uh, from 1966, uh, putting together a grant proposal when I got here and, and reading about Bruce Merrifeld's robot. Uh, I, I knew Bruce Merrifeld's work very well. He's one of the, one of the giants of, of our field uh, and, and won the, you know, uh, justifiably won the Nobel Prize in 1984 for his work. But, uh, but I, I was kind of floored to see this schematic in, 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 uh, in a paper from 1966 uh, that is, frankly, every bit as sophisticated as a modern chemistry robot. Uh, and, and so it was kind of, you know, there, there's so much activity in, in robots for chemistry right now. And, and Jing just mentioned, or I can't remember uh, who mentioned, you know, Toronto's got 200 million to build self-driving labs and, and, and multiple centers like this are popping up. Uh, in, in, uh, there's a $1.25 billion investment in Germany uh, to, to use AI and, 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 uh, and others. Uh, and so, so, but you know, you go back, 1966 is uh, long before I was on this planet, uh, chemistry robots were, were pretty, pretty sophisticated back then. Uh, into the 90s, uh, th this was a new, another robot uh, built by a Japanese team that was, was uh, now making pretty sophisticated chemicals. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, this, is a pe this is one of the world's first peptide synthesizers, so this could make uh, uh, amide bonds. Uh, and, then, and then this was a robot that could make lots of different types of chemical bonds. Uh, another big uh, development in, the, in, the, in this area was uh, Eli Lilly's automated synthesis lab. This was in uh, their Indiana site. They rebuilt uh, version two in San Diego. Uh, and now uh, these have kind of turned into cloud labs, like the Emerald Cloud Lab or Stratios's lab. But it, this is pretty sophisticated stuff, right? So 
Uh, you can see each one of these little boxes is, 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 is a little peripheral or robot type device uh, that shuttles around liquids and solids and, and tries to make a chemical. Uh, there, was a, there was a really nice uh, development from, uh, from uh, my good friend uh, Marty Burke at uh, Urbana Champagne uh, where, where they have this flow based robot uh, that, that makes uh, a variety of carbon carbon bond. Uh, uh, based uh, systems. Uh, then uh, in um, somewhat more recently, uh, Lee Cronin uh, in, in, in Scotland uh, has, has been uh, pushing this computer uh, system, uh, which is one that we work on. And so if you've, if you've taken introductory organic chemistry classes and you've been inside of a chemistry lab, then some of this equipment will look very common to you. Uh, this is a, here's, here's a flask. It's a little bit fancy. This is just a, this is like what a modern reflux condenser looks like. Uh, it's hooked up to a nitrogen line so that we can protect our chemicals from the air that might get in there. There's a waste in the back, uh, and then there's a, there's a filtration system here. Uh, this, is, this is a robotic version of a separatory funnel, but you can see it's just regular glassware. Uh, and it goes into a rotary evaporator, which if you've taken Org 1 or Org 2, you've, you've probably had your hands on one of these. Uh, and, but the, the, the point is that it's, you know, it's, it's automating what a human can do. Right? And, I, and I think that a lot of the, the discussion around robotics for chemistry uh, falls in that space. Here's, uh, here's one out of uh, the team at MIT uh, that does something similar. They, here they have, uh, they have one of these six-axis robots that can, can uh, grab a little reactor from here and move it around. Uh, and so you know, we're, we're very inspired by this, this generation of, of robotics in the field of chemistry. This is one of the, you know, this is another famous one of this little kind of Amazon warehouse style robot that drives around uh, the lab and no humans go in the lab and it moves the chemicals around. Uh, and so I think, you know, there's the design make test of drugs is, is presently, uh, you know, the pharmaceutical industry is presently a $1 trillion industry. And so there's, there's a lot of reason to to automate processes and accelerate processes to remove human error from here. Uh, I got my start thinking about robotics and you know, there, there was a, a, a lot of thought around uh, automating away jobs or that was often a discussion as, I, you know, as, a, as an industrial chemist, I was excited to get into robotics and, uh, and you know, my seniors among me would say, oh, well, yeah, that's, you know, the really senior folks who were in management were like, oh, great, let's, let's improve efficiency. Uh, but then, you know, kind of the, the lower level uh, management would say, well, but are you going to, you know, are you going to automate away jobs? And so over, over 15 years, I've thought a lot about that. And, and, uh, and, and one of the ways we've thought about things is, or I like to think about automating what a human cannot do. And I think that's been kind of the marching orders of, of a lot of our, our lab. Uh, so we, 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 now we're starting to get into self-driving labs and we're excited about, about that. But, but we like to think, you know, at least my journey into chemistry automation has really focused on doing things that are, you know, using a robot to do things that a human cannot do. Not building a robot necessarily that can, you know, repeat human, human derived tasks. And so miniaturization was a big part of that. Uh, here's uh, Yuning uh, working on one of, this is a mosquito robot that I'll talk about uh, in some detail. Uh, you can see that uh, we work in, inside of inert atmosphere glove boxes and that's important to us. Uh, and, but the, the key is that there's a thousand uh, experiments in her hand or, or 1,500 experiments in her hands. Uh, and and that's, uh, you know, that's something that we cannot do as humans. Uh, and so, so we've, used, uh, we've used automation uh, in that way. That said, we're, we're very excited to go and grab a, a, you know, a big flask and, uh, and run things the regular way. Um, we, the way that we built the lab is, is we, we have in place the automation capabilities, uh, but we also have the classics and, and we embrace the classic ways of doing things. Uh, but uh, uh, we're excited about this idea of, of, of miniaturization. And, and so the, you know, this, the status quo for chemistry experimentation, I guess when I did my training was a flask. Probably today, it's a it's a two dram vial, uh, and uh, and 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 a, a lot of my uh, my interests over the years have been pushing down into these 1536 well plates because you get more information and you get systematically captured information, uh, and uh, and we were, you know, I think one of the drivers in, in pushing in this direction, we, we started wanting to go into microfluidics and and thinking that you know we should have a microfluidic device which would be. Uh, the, the right way to do this. And, and I, I mentioned already that we work inside of an inert atmospheric glove box. This is important because every experiment that matters to me will, will burst into flames in air. Uh, and, and if it sees air or water, the data is useless uh, for, for almost every experiment that we work on. And so, so we really focus on 
uh, inert atmosphere chemistry, and so so we you know we, we thought that microfluidics would be would be really helpful. Uh, and uh, but then uh, at the time I was working uh, at, at Merck Research Labs uh, in our Rahway facility, uh, and and I, I went to the labs where they where they run uh, automated biochemical experiments and saw instruments like this. Uh, where they had giant rooms with you know only robots, no no humans. These are uh, these are you know kind of older style arms. Uh, these are still used in in drug discovery. And then each one of these little little boxes is uh, you know at least a hundred thousand dollar piece of equipment uh, that, that that generates some of the in, uh, instrumentation. Here's a, um, uh, Ian showed us a, 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 a C or D sealer. This, here's one of the older versions of of, of those. Uh, but you know what we went to this this lab. Uh, intent on telling them that microfluidics was the future and we need you to develop a microfluidic device so that my chemis the chemicals that will burst into flames uh, can, can be handled. Uh, and, and then we saw what they were doing, we said, oh, well, maybe we should kind of cool it on the, on the, on the microfluidics and, and, and look into what these guys are up to. Uh, and, and I think, you know, ultimately what we learned is that the, the well plate has such a rich history uh, that it makes a lot of sense to to just you know come to this this infrastructure around engineering around well plates and so for us this was uh, this was a key decision point uh, in the journey that we weren't going to do microfluidics that we were going to use well plates instead uh, and uh, and you know just recognizing that the 96 well plate if you if you if you're in the life sciences or close to the life sciences you probably uh, are aware of a 96 well plate if not uh, they're they're uh, they're they're tools for doing many different experiments. Here I show a 384, 1536, and 3456 well plates. Uh, the, the, the key point is that these are all standardized. They're, they don't look like it on the slide, but these are the exact same dimensions. Uh, and so I can pick up a 1536 well plate from my robot. I can bring it to uh, Brazil, and it will still fit on, on a robot down there, um, which is kind of kind of key. But you know, there's, there's just it's almost a hundred year infrastructure at this point around well plates, and so so we chose to uh, to work in this space. Um, uh, I, for this talk, I chose to go way back. Uh, and bring up, uh, I haven't talked about this slide in a long time. Uh, and so this was, uh, th this, is, uh, this is my hand uh, running a, uh, the, the first 1536 experiment. Uh, this was on my birthday in, in 2012, and so I'd been dreaming of this experiment for many years, and, 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 I, and I decided, okay, well, I'm just, it's my birthday, I'm just gonna clear my calendar, I'm canceling all my meetings, and I'm gonna run this experiment. Uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and so it was very simple. Uh, we were, you can see, I, here's my, it, this is a glove inside of a glove box, uh, and we had a hand pipette, uh, and so we just set up uh, six, six reactions in quadruplicate uh, in four different, th this, was, this was our standard reactor, and we still use this plenty, uh, but we just wanted a head-to-head -head comparison among these different uh, things, and I had no idea, you know, should I use a polystyrene uh, plate with foil or, or uh, cyclic octane copolymer plate uh, with foil or with just a lid sitting on top. And you can see it doesn't really matter. So the, the, the four different shades of gray here are the four different reaction vessels. Uh, the, the results are, are more or less equivalent. Uh, and so this was super exciting uh, to, uh, to, to, to generate this data. Uh, and uh, then uh, we, we spent a lot of time working uh, by hand. Uh, then we, we, we actually acquired this robot uh, this one is in my lab, uh, the chemistry building, right, right next door here. Uh, and uh, oh, did that? Just want to get it going again. Um, oh no, the spinning rainbow wheel of death right now. Uh, well, hopefully, hopefully she'll choose to come back. Um, uh, so this, uh, the way that this robot works is it's a positive displacement system. So these are, uh, these are little pins, uh, and they, they withdraw uh, chemicals up into the pin. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the cool thing about that is that it doesn't matter what the viscosity or the, the, the properties of the, of the mixture are. Um, hmm. It really wanted to update this morning all week. It's been trying to update. I've been like, no, no, I'm busy. Um, and now here we are. Uh, uh, 
I don't know if you can help, but. <laughs> Well, I don't know if it's trying to update. It's just trying to. It's <laughs> it won't give me anything. I'll do a song and dance for you guys. But. Okay. Sincere apologies, guys. So the, um, the, the fun thing about that robot that I was showing, it's, it's sold by a British company, uh, and they came here recently and were telling me that the very first one was piloted here in, in Ann Arbor when, when Pfizer was here. Uh, and uh, they actually didn't know that it would work, so they, it was all like these little tailor uh, sewing pins were, the, were those needles. Uh, and... Uh, and so they, they arrived with the robot completely in suitcases, assembled it here at Pfizer, really hoping it would work. This is like probably 2005 or something like this. Uh, and, and we're successful. Now this robot is all over the pharmaceutical industry. Oh, that's not going to work. Okay. So let's try this. Okay. Sorry, guys. Uh, if you can just kind of quickly like whatever you're looking at on Facebook and come back. Um, <laughs> The, uh, so, all right, so I won't try and play that video, um, but uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, we got our hands on this robot and we did a head-to-head -head comparison of, of, uh, of, of the status quo, which was vials and the plates, and you can see that the fidelity is pretty good. Uh, and so this was exciting because it meant that we could miniaturize reactions and run, uh, run lots of reactions, and then we've had a good run of, of, uh, of discussing uh, how we can use this robot in synthetic organic chemistry. Uh, and uh, and we've, um, uh, we've done a lot of work uh, thinking about where chemicals come from. Uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this is an AI software that we've worked with uh, called Cynthia, uh, which is a commercial uh, software package. Uh, and uh, the way Cynthia works is it navigates through uh, recipes for chemical reactions uh, towards, uh, towards uh, chemicals you can make. And so, uh, one, one of the journeys that we went on during COVID was to uh, identify uh, ways to make these antiviral drugs. And what you can see is that there's, I mean, these are, these are very heavily curated data sets, uh, but each one of these is a contingency plan to the synthesis of, of, a, uh, of a potential COVID drug uh, where we were trying to address uh, potential supply chain issues uh, around these medicines. Um, we, uh, we, we have worked uh, uh, with, with, this, with this platform uh, in the area of uh, natural product total synthesis, and so uh, this, is, uh, th this is a natural product called stemoamide. It's been used for centuries in, in Chinese traditional medicine. Uh, this is a molecule of some uh, molecular complexity, uh, somewhat challenging to make. Uh, it had been made before, 32 times before this molecule had been made, uh, and, and so we chose that as a benchmark because 32 teams had made this before. Uh, we, we used our uh, AI platform uh, to, to generate a six-step synthesis of the molecule, which was the 33rd and shortest synthesis of the molecule. But in doing that, we learned a lot about how to gravitate to high impact steps, and we shortened the whole thing in half. And so we had the 33rd and shortest synthesis of the molecule at six steps, and then the 34th uh, synthesis, which was only three steps, uh, and, and, and that worked out well. Um, we, we did this by, by leveraging some kind of 
funny reactions. Uh, it, you know, it, it, it's, it was somewhat surprising both to us that the computer recommended we, you know, we want to get to this five-membered ring with a nitrogen in it, and, and, and the computer said, you can get there with this four-membered ring. Uh, and that's kind of hidden, like we, we hadn't seen that as humans, and so the computer can kind of help us to navigate through these tricky bits. Uh, but one of the, uh, one of the exciting things uh, that, that we do in our lab is try to invent new chemical reactions uh, and, and, and think on how we can leverage new chemical reactions towards uh, the uh, invention of medicine. Uh, as, I, as I've said, the pharmaceutical industry is a $1 trillion industry, uh, and if you scrape all of the patents from that industry, uh, look at the reactions that are used uh, in it, you'll, you'll see that, that there's one that is used with high frequency, uh, much higher frequency than any others, which is shown here. It's the peptide coupling, uh, where you take an amine, a carboxylic acid, and unite it to make an amide bond. Uh, I showed you uh, the, the Bruce Merrifeld's robot from 1966, uh, which uh, won the Nobel Prize of 1984. Uh, it was to run this exact reaction. Uh, and so, you know, if you're, if you're inventing drugs, there's a good chance that this is the reaction you're going to run. Uh, you take an amine, you take an acid, and you click them together to make an amide. Beautiful reaction. It works. Uh, we asked the question, uh, oops, uh, where are we? Here. Uh, we asked the question, uh, what are the other ways you can bring these two pieces together? Uh, and, uh, and it turns out there's 56 million ways that you can unite this amine and this acid. Uh, none of these are reactions that exist. And so we, we asked the question, can we, can we use robotics and algorithms to try and make them exist? Uh, the, but as a medicinal chemist, they're highly relevant. This, this uh, amine acid coupling makes a molecule that has an NH bond and, uh, and a hydrogen bond acceptor. Uh, that means that this molecule is less likely to get into the brain. Uh, it's just the virtue of, uh, you know, when you have H bonds on your molecule, they're just not going to get into the brain as readily. So if I'm trying to treat Alzheimer's or brain cancer or depression or sleeping uh, insomnia, uh, this is not a good reaction for me, right? Uh, but we, we, we would argue that, uh, that one of these other ones, you know, th uh, these first three molecules are, are, are just going to be more readily uh, able to get into the brain. Uh, and so we've identified transition metal catalysts that can achieve uh, each of these different transformations. Uh, and, you know, the idea is like rather than going to your box of Lego and, and getting two Lego bits and always clicking them together the same way, what happens if you only think about your two bits of Lego and move them around uh, in, in diverse ways? Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, there are, uh, there are 56 million possible ways to do this. A lot of them are complete nonsense. This one's going to be quite tricky, and perhaps my granddaughter will be able to tell you about it. Uh, there's, no way for, <laughs> there's no way to really think about modern uh, physical principles and get this to happen. But it doesn't really break any of the laws of physics. We just, we just need to find some, some special catalyst that could make this happen. Uh, and so the way that we think about doing that uh, is, is, uh, is through experimentation. Uh, so uh, in this particular instance, uh, we were looking at amines and acids and, and thinking about how they can connect to make this amide bond in the traditional format. Uh, uh, we've published uh, work, I, I, it's uh, published in 2021, I think, uh, to make esters instead. And so the, the cool thing is that, you know, the only difference between these two molecules is that the NH has turned into an oxygen. Uh, this is a molecule that is, is much more likely to cross the blood-brain barrier to have permeability into cells. Uh, and uh, so, so we, uh, we navigate through this uh, uh, by building these arrays of, of reactions. And so what I'm showing you here is 24 reactions uh, where we're looking at uh, different transition metal catalysts. These are, these are things that are above the reaction arrow, okay? So I want to take this piece, this piece, and make this product. And then I'm, to do that, I'm going to mix all this stuff together in my flask or in my little well plate. Uh, and uh, we have a software uh, that, that, that sets this up. So, so each, each square here has five components to it. That means that it's got this, this, uh, one of these, one of these, one of these, and then we have the same solvent and everything's done under nitrogen. Uh, and, uh, but you can see some of the types of things that we're putting into our pot here. So silver nitrate, copper iodide, xanthos is an is a, is a organo uh, ligand, uh, palladium DBA, different, you know, different metal salts. We're, we're just zooming through the periodic table looking for interesting organometallic complexes that can achieve these new bond forming reactions. Uh, and, uh, and so we, we run the experiment uh, and then the data comes out looking like this. We get a hit 
Uh, here with pyridine and copper iodide and, and silver nitrate, this was a good uh, uh, hit based on an LC mass spec analysis of our reaction mixture. Most, most of these reactions don't work. Uh, that is very much the case in our experiments that you know, probably 90% of experiments we run fail. Uh, very small amounts of them uh, succeed. Uh, and then, you know, we, we kind of get a bit more rich information on this. We, we did some 96 more screens and follow up and followed up on that with 96 more and kind of confirmed that, you know, that it works. But uh, then, uh, then we go into our 1536 capability and, 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 and look at the synthesis of a lot of these different uh, uh, components. Uh, and so uh, we, we've done this on maybe a dozen reactions at this point, this idea of kind of like looking through reactions that don't work, finding, finding a little glimmer of a hit, and then optimizing on that towards something that actually works quite well. Uh, we use a software that we've written here called Factor uh, to do this, uh, and it's really just uh, uh, something that enables the, the, this workflow in, in a very easy format. Uh, it, it, we, we, we try to uh, make it user friendly. It's, it's uh, entirely free for academic use at this point, so you can go to factor.cerniclab.com and play around with this uh, and, and, and design these, these types of uh, 96, here's a 96 well grade, you can go uh, 2496 or 1536. Uh, we, we would run, here's, here's what a typical data output would look like. This is kind of in the raw data. Uh, where uh, you, know, you can see some patterns here. So here's 96 uh, HPLC traces stacked on top of each other. And I can see like, you know, every, eight, like every eight wells, I probably had the same catalyst in there, for instance. And so that's, that's what that little pattern is showing you. But then there's an outlier here, right? And so then that, that's the type of thing that would catch our attention. And, and we might want to go and take a closer look at that. Uh, we've plugged Factor into ChatGPT. It works pretty well, uh, particularly if you are, are uh, using uh, uh, um, uh, chemistries that, are, that there's a lot of literature behind. Uh, so we, we, uh, we, we asked ChatGPT the following, generate a three ligand by four catalyst by two base reaction array for a Buckwald-Hartwig coupling. Uh, so the Buckwald-Hartwig coupling is the third most popular reaction used in drug discovery, which means that it appears in lots of patents. Uh, and I think that's probably where ChatGPT has, has gotten this data. A lot of the cooler chemistry I'd want to look at is, is published in the Journal of uh, American Chemical Society or, or PNAS, and, and so that's behind a paywall, and I don't think ChatGPT knows a lot about that type of chemistry, uh, but if it's in patents, it, it, seems to, it seems to do a pretty good job. Uh, and so ChatGPT gave us uh, this recipe of ligands, catalysts, and bases. Uh, to use, we plugged that into Factor and, and, uh, and, and got this, this recipe, which we executed. Uh, and got this, uh, this LCMS trace. We, we took this, this one hit here with palladium DPPF and RUFOS and scaled it up. Uh, and this was one of, the, one of the purest reactions we've run in the lab. We've run many thousands of them and this just works really well. So it was kind of a, you know, impressive that, uh, that ChatGPT uh, could, could do that. Uh, we, we, we saw Opentrons already. We, we do use Opentrons uh, a little bit. Ours is inside of a glove box, as I said. Uh, the, the nice thing is about it is that uh, the commercial uh, robot fits inside of a, uh, the commercial standard default uh, glove box size. And, uh, and uh, we, uh, th this was kind of fun for us during the pandemic. We don't do this too much anymore, but we did have the, the robot hooked up on Zoom. Uh, here's, here's us social distancing around the town of Ann Arbor. Uh, with, with Sam being the sole person in the lab or there, you know, one, one other person was, was down the hall to make sure that Sam didn't get hurt. But, uh, but you know, we, we could dial in and, and with Factor kind of plug in our, our recipes from around the town of Ann Arbor uh, and, and, and get into this robot. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to bring this up. Uh, so I've introduced two robots, uh, which we've been, we've been spending a lot of time uh, integrating. Uh, we, we presently have a human do the weighing, which is fine. Uh, we, we do have a human hand. I should draw in here. There's a human hand that pushes the plate from this robot to this robot. Uh, we, we are working uh, to, uh, to put a, a, a robot hand into that, into that process. Uh, but um, as I said, you know, we, we've gravitated to uh, reactions that, or, or processes that uh, humans cannot do. And so, so you know, it's going to cost me, I don't know, I'd, I'd love to see your quotes, probably 200K for sealing, desealing, and an arm. Um, 
versus you know to, to replace three seconds of, of graduate student uh, time. Um, but but I, we actually need it right now because we're running at such a pace. Uh, so this year we've we've executed seventy thousand reactions, which is a kind of a new uh, level for us. Uh, this has been uh, very uh, nicely supported by Schmidt Futures to, to kind of turn us up um, a, a couple levels and, and get this data out there. Uh, my question to Ian about you know how how how, to, how, to, how does the community want data, uh, and um, uh, and so now what we're seeing is that uh, is that you know that if I if I set up the plate here and I wait. 48 seconds and move it to here, the results are slightly different than if I set up the plate here and wait 12 seconds and, and move it to here. And so, um, so now we need a, a robot to, to have that control uh, over, uh, over, over the, uh, the uh, level of uh, experimentation we're doing. And so um, I'll just quickly end by saying that, uh, you know, we, 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 I've spoken mostly about how we think about making things. Uh, we have been plugging in the testing part of this, uh, imagining a workflow where you know, design, make, test, design, make, test is happening inside of a computer and a robot interface. Uh, and so, uh, so we, we had previously published uh, that you can run a 1536 well plate of experiments, get, get the information, uh, and then, uh, well, as a synthetic chemist, 0.05 milligrams of material is, is, is a very small amount of material. Uh, for a biochemical assay, that's tons. And so, uh, so you can, you know, easily get uh, biochemical information, uh, and uh, and we, uh, we've published on this in 2018. Uh, here's, here's some recent data on, on a publication that we're uh, running where we, we've, uh, we've achieved a uh, three-step synthesis in, in 1536 well plates to make a variety of these uh, CDK2 inhibitors with, uh, with relay therapeutics. And, uh, and then uh, all this is showing is that, you know, that we, can, we can take these thousands of molecules uh, on the nanoscale and, uh, and, and generate information. Basically, these, these are going to be the good compounds and these are the less good compounds. Uh, and so I can generate that information on, on a high throughput and on a miniaturized scale. Uh, and uh, the, the, one of the exciting developments in this work is that we can take our mixtures and go directly into crystal structures. Um, we saw some really beautiful uh, uh, applications of, of uh, beam lines. Uh, just uh, just before, and so uh, so we we've taken uh, five of these chemicals and put them directly into crystal structures, uh, and uh, and we get the, this information. And so uh, with you know 0 0.05 milligrams of material, I can tell you does the reaction work? Is it potent? And how does it bind into the stuff? We're we're now trying to layer on some of the uh, adsorption and toxicology properties that that you would think of as a drug hunter. Um, and so, uh, so I'll end there. We, our, our dream is that you know that you can you can accelerate the invention of a medicine, uh, and and you know uh, that we can uh, increasingly uh, engage new new patient populations or or those who are who are in, in most urgent need. Um, uh, I, I, I have the extreme pleasure of working with such a, a great uh, team of, of workers uh, and and uh, and getting uh, appropriate support to do that. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here. And I'm happy to take a question if time allows. Oh, um, well, you mentioned um, that you know the factor software is open source data that like anybody can access. And um, for, you know, some people like, you know, for example, I'm like a very curious person and I, I like, I enjoy learning that stuff and, and I enjoy, you know, having that information. But um, at the same time, you know, um, uh, some people will use that like open source information, you know, for um, unethical purposes. Um, and while it doesn't directly relate to chemistry, um, I know recently um, the company 23andMe, um, uh, there was a data breach that um, ended up like leaking, I think like over like a million people's um, genetic information. Um, and it was done with malicious purposes. Um, but then at the same time, like, like for, you know, people who are genuinely curious in that research, like, like 
theoretically they could you know use that data to research which I don't think is the most ethical way to go about it um, and I'm just like wondering what your uh, thoughts are on you know like where's the line between you know trying to access information solely for curiosity um, versus you know respecting the privacy of individuals um, and their data yeah uh, thank you so much for for this question uh, and actually, th this is something I'm hoping to talk about in, the, in this forum in, in the upcoming uh, discussions. Uh, that I, it, maybe it's not quite your question, but one way I've been thinking about it is like, I've, I've been, I've been you know, chanting about open source un until January of this year, right? When I was like, oh, like, we'll share it. Like, let's get all the data out there. Everyone can benefit from this. Uh, in my mind, that kind of meant like, you know, research facilities that don't have the resources as, as one like this, or, you know, so, so that in a, you know, underdeveloped country, people can start working on this. But now I'm realizing that, like, well, then, but it's also now for profit, right? That OpenAI and, and other companies have that. And so, so I'm curious, you know, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm curious what people in this room think about uh, that, you know, I had never thought of open source as being a capitalist uh, endeavor. Uh, and, and now I'm thinking a lot about that. Um, uh, on the, so um, what you, one of the, uh, I was thinking about the concept of dual use uh, in what you were describing, that, you know, I, I dream of doing this for medicine, right? And I dream of, of uh, improving human health using, using rapid uh, um, experimentation tools. Uh, toxins can be invented in the same way. And so, um, uh, you know, the, the FBI and, and other um, uh, entities that, that are, you know, uh, looking at defense are, are deeply interested in this topic. Um, around, um, uh, you know, the, the kind of worst case scenario is the genesis of chemical weapons, right? Uh, and uh, w different than the, 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 um, the, 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 what you brought in about 23andMe. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I don't have an answer. I actually, I have a lot of questions in that area that, you know, I think open source is great because it allows everyone to, to, to participate. Uh, there's a dual use concern, and then I'm also curious about the, the you know, if if uh, if profitability, um, you know, how do, how does um, I I I, uh, I love OpenAI, um, but I was yeah. We'll talk more about that. Yeah, I have a question on on your. I think you can call it factor. Yes. A really interesting um, approach, uh, especially uh, in the um, hybridization of dialogue systems like ChatGPT and, and, and your experimental constraints. But the, to my knowledge, ChatGPT does not yet have the capability of attribution of the particular sources that it used to generate its response to the query. Right. So how do you know when you make a, a query on, say, a particular reaction that you're, you're trying to achieve and, and what types of, of um, catalysts, or I guess, or you, you want to use in your in your wells. How do you know what the the data support the number of patents, for example, um, that support that particular uh, uh, set of uh, reactions or part or a particular set of catalysts that are yeah uh, responded. I, I, so I didn't get into it at the bottom of the paragraph. It, it said uh, respond with DOIs from where you get the data, uh, which of course, you know, it, it, we did the experiment in early February of this year, and so we didn't, I mean, now the, the DOIs were completely hallucinated, and, and uh, but they, they look nice. Um, they, uh, uh, I, I think what, so, you know, what, what we, what my, under, what my belief is, is that if there is a large corpus of publicly available information, it does a pretty good job. Uh, if we, but we're always, we're trying to invent a new reaction and it does a miserable job of, of helping us come up with recipes in that area. Uh, and that, but the nice thing about the partnership between ChatGPT and Factor is Factor is a, is a way to sample a general area of space, right? So I think that ChatGPT gives you, you know, we tend to ask it for an answer and it's giving you an approximation of, of, of where it is, right? And so, so rather than saying, tell me which experiment I should run, we say, tell me the 96 or 24 experiments I should run, and then ChatGPT kind of helps us get into that space. And then you um, can filter it for the extra knowledge. Yes, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for the question. All right, let's uh, yeah. um, let's move on.